I'm going to get a little controversial. You've already gotten a little controversial. <laughs> We've already talked about Asperger and race. Those just are two a, of the most controversial. Just a little bit more. We're going to inch it over just a little bit more because I do okay. want to hear your thoughts on this. And it doesn't sure. have anything to do with your book. I mean, you kind sure. of touched a little bit on it. But I want to know what your thoughts are about Autism Speaks as an advocacy organization. And I'll have a follow-up question as to who do you support? What advocacy organizations do you support? We have a lot of new parents uh, in the group. We have a lot of teachers in the group. And every April comes around and everybody's doing, uh, everybody. the money starts flowing in April, right? For Autism Awareness Month, World Autism Day. And Autism Speaks is on, I mean, they've got a lot of ads out. So, you know, people donate to them. And I want to hear your thoughts on, on that organization. Okay. I am not a supporter of Autism Speaks. I have never done a, uh, an event for them. Uh, when I was invited to the Smithsonian to talk about uh, problems of representation of autistic people in media, I was actually invited by a science officer of Autism Speaks. And I did it because what I planned to do and did was to spend the entire time talking about the horrible portrayals of autism that Autism Speaks has put into the media. I mean, that you know, a lot of people know about their video, I Am Autism, which basically presented autism as like somewhere between a pedophile and a disease stalking kids in school. I mean, they, they put out horrible messaging. Another uh, horrible message that they put out, even against uh, the desires of some of their own scientists, I later discovered, was uh, Jerry Dawson, the former scientist, uh, chief science officer of Autism Speaks, went on every network news station saying that autism was an epidemic. Uh, that sounds like something you can catch in the schoolyard to me. Uh, and when I asked her, uh, you know, why she used the word epidemic when her own scientists were not using that word, she said, well, that was, you know, basically just to catch the attention of people in Congress. Nobody listens if you say, well, maybe there's been a true rise in prevalence or not, you know. So um, I have other problems with Autism Speaks. Uh, some of them you tell. Are, well, I'll give you an example. I went to visit Autism Speaks headquarters at one point, and uh, this was not related to the interview I was doing there, uh, but it was, I saw a group of young autistic adults being sort of led around the headquarters in the most condescending way. Um, it was, uh, they were not being treated well. And I was truly horrified, to be honest with you. As if they were put on display or were, or, or. The, the person was just had no, like they were, just, you know, it was like, the, it, it was as if the person thought they were herding cattle or something, you know, I mean, it was really, it was grotesque actually. Um, also, the executives at Autism Speaks uh, famously, you know, took very high salaries. Um, and I'm, one of the things that I'm proud of, actually, is that uh, my book became a New York Times bestseller with not only no help from Autism Speaks, zero, no help, but the only time they ever mentioned my book, which was a freaking New York Times bestseller on their blog, was a very critical a personal uh, comment made about me by their former president, Liz Fell. And, you know, what can I say? Um, uh, the one thing I do want to say is that I'm not in favor of uh, the puzzle piece. You know, I, I think even with the rainbow that they've now, you know, put on it, you know, they've sort of realized like, oh, we can't stop just dismissing this neurodiversity thing. So we'll make our puzzle piece a rainbow. Well, now um, they're appropriating the rainbow for their, I mean, geez, we don't, well, I don't you know, I mean, stay over okay, there. Uh, you know, the rainbow is, a, you know, it's okay. But, uh, but still they definitely are trying to appropriate some kind of neurodiversity vibe. One thing that, um, one thing that, uh, sorry, sorry, I'm getting distracted. By That's okay. <laughs> One thing that um, is true is that um, there was a, uh, the, the reason the puzzle piece came to be identified with autism was not Autism Speaks. The puzzle piece was in use uh, starting from the very first parents association uh, in the world 
which became the inspiration for Bernie Rimland uh, to uh, start what became the National Autistic Society here. Uh, back then in London, it was called the National Association for uh, Autistic Children or something like that. It's in my book. Um, anyway, they, a parent, a father, developed a puzzle piece because he was so blown away by the fact that his autistic kid could put together jigsaw puzzles upside down without looking at the image. So it didn't start out as an insult, um, but certainly by now with the appropriation of that symbol by Autism Speaks, Autism Speaks has been so insulting and unapologetic and dismissive of autistic voices. That's yeah. what they're doing. Yeah. They marginalize the voices of autistic adults, the people most affected by the images that they spread. Um, so no, I do, not, uh, I do not support Autism Speaks personally. Although, you know, I mean, I will say there are a couple of good people, in the, you know, who I met in the organization, but, yeah. uh, you know, as every a whole, their message right. is damaging. Their whole message, I'm not. As I'm a whole, yeah. And what I would suggest is that, you know, obviously, like, sometimes I see, like, parents get attacked because they're kind of naive about the history and they want to do something for autism. Uh, and uh, what I do suggest is that there's an organization called the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, A-S-A-N, mm -hmm. or Aut Self-Advocacy on Twitter. They do really oh, great wow. work. They do work in public policy because the guy who founded the organization, as I talk about in my book, Ari Niemann, um, uh, founded that group when he was a teenager. And he, he is... his you know, special interest, as, as people say, was public policy. He's incredibly effective um, policy uh, uh, maker and critiquer. And Your friend um, Dr. Prezant would call that his enthusiasm. Yes, exactly. And that's a very good word. And by the way, I love Barry Prezant. And his book, uh, Uniquely Human, came out the same month, I think, that Neurotribes did. We instantly discovered that they were like sister books in a way. I think of my book as the history and his book as the history applied, really. He like, came for a meeting, I think in December, and we talked about that because I asked him, I think I asked him a question about your book and he told us that they came out within maybe weeks of each other. So that yeah, they fun. did, they did. And plus he's such a great guy and something I would very much recommend for parents who are feeling burned out uh, yes, wonderful book. I completely endorse it. And um, for pa parents, uh, he does an annual retreat that I believe you can get full scholarship for. And, you know, a lot of parents say, oh, I could never have, you know, two days free, you know, to do this. Every parent I've ever spoken to who attended Barry Presents annual retreat felt really encouraged by it and felt really supported by the a community of other parents. He talked I, about that retreat in his book. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, Ed Barry's a wonderful guy. We have so many comments. I think that we've, uh, we've lit some fire. Yeah. <laughs> and there are other, by the way, I don't want to say that, you know, ASAN is the only group I support. They're not. There's a group in uh, the UK called Autistic UK uh, on Twitter that is wonderful. I did a, um, presentation, not a presentation, I took part in a uh, sort of a panel. Um, well, I attended an event and spoke, um, run in Manchester by Autistic UK. They were wonderful and interesting thing. Um, you know, oftentimes there's sort of this controversy between it's, you know, it's like framed as autistic adults versus parents, you know, mm -hmm. almost everybody in that room was a parent themselves and they were all autistic. And um, it was a thrilling event. Uh, so for, you know, if anybody hears this in Europe, Autistic UK is a great uh, organization. I get, I just got contacted yesterday. I haven't even had the chance to look at it yet. But another group of autistic adults uh, that um, is, you know, instead of depending on a neurotypical run organization to look out for their interests, they're, you know, they're doing it themselves. And I'm very much in favor of either autistic run organizations or organizations that include autistic adults at the top level 
in decision-making roles and in public spokespeople roles. Um, and not is, just one token, not just one. Yeah, not token. just one token. I mean, John Elder Robeson, who's a very good friend of mine, he's the author of the bestseller, Look Me in the Eye. You know, he was the, he was the I don't want to insult him and say he was the token at Autism Speak for a while, right. but he kind of was. Um, and, um, you know, he was so mistreated that he eventually quit. Um, so uh, we need full autistic representation in uh, groups that are about autism. And that's something that I put into practice myself. And I'll give you a very uh, crisp example. Um, the uh, Autism Society of America um, asked me a couple of years ago to give a closing keynote for their annual conference. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I, enough of me talking, you know, enough of an NT, like taking up the spotlight. So I said, what I'd rather do is just moderate a panel of autistic adults, including, by the way, an autistic adult who, who used typing to speak. So it was not like all, you know, shiny autistics, as uh, people say. Um, and I asked them to develop their own topics for discussion. So it wasn't even me like saying, I want to hear about what you right. guys think about blah, blah, blah. You know, it was what they wanted to talk about. And I asked the Autism Society of America if we could do that instead of me giving another presentation. They went for it. It was a marvelous event. So Great. what I've done is to try to I'm going to drink some water here. It has oranges in it. It's not a cocktail. Darn, <laughs> it should be. Well, I'm the son of an alcoholic, so I can't really do it. But um, in any case, um, it turned out to be a really uh, illuminating event for everyone. I uh, bet. For the parents, for the clinicians, and for the autistic adults. So when I can, I'm not always given the choice, but when I can, I try to share the attention that I get. And whenever... Uh, and I've been doing this even uh, from before the book came out. Whenever a journalist um, asks me, you know, Steve, what do you think about blah, blah, blah about autism? I say, have you talked to autistic adults? You know, and I give them, uh, I make it easy. You know, I give them emails, I give them phone numbers. And then uh, autistic voices come to the fore in the social conversation about autism, which is how it should be. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. There are so many 